We are continuing on this morning in our Advent series, which, as I explained last week, is the celebration within the Christian calendar of Christ's first coming and also a reminder that Christ will come again. Uh, that as surely as he came the first time, born in a manger, through the Virgin Mary, and given unto us, as we read in Isaiah, that we are reminded that Jesus has promised that he will return again for his church, or as he calls us, and fittingly so, with some of the scriptures we're going to be reading, with what we just accomplished, his bride, that we are the bride of Christ. And Jesus said that he goes to prepare a place for us, that he goes to prepare mansions and cities, and he's going to prepare a banqueting table that we will all rejoice and celebrate in when Christ retrieves his church. And I am talking about, of course, the rapture of Jesus coming back and taking his church off of this earth and bringing them back into heaven with him uh, for a short time before then we do return with him to bring judgment upon the earth. So I don't want to get too far into that because some of you might, your head might start to explode. But I'm just wanting to tell you this now, and we went through it last week, that the prophecies that were given, us, given to us throughout the Old Testament, starting in Genesis all the way through Malachi, Throughout all of those, you can go through and research the scriptures, and if you didn't hear last week's sermon, I would encourage you to go and listen to it because we went very methodically, and we laid out the prophecies of Jesus' coming and how Jesus fulfilled them to the very inch of everything that was said, that he was born in a manger, that he flew, that his flight was over to Egypt, and then he returned to Nazareth, and all of the things that happened in Christ's birth as well as his resurrection and his death were fulfilled perfectly. And as we know and see that his prophecies from the Old Testament about his coming the first time was fulfilled, that Jesus in Matthew 24 begins to lay out the fact and the promise that he will come back again. And so what I was reminding us of last week is that as surely as he was faithful, the Father was faithful to fulfill the prophecy the first time, we can rest assured that he will fulfill the prophecy to come a second time. Here's the thing. Jesus, when he returns the second time, is not coming as he did the first time that he will look much different. And you can go into Revelation and get a little bit of a glimpse of what he will look like, but it, will say, it says that he comes back with flames of, or with eyes of fire. Uh, King of kings, Lord of lords, coming to judge uh, all of mankind, that he comes as the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, not the, the uh, sacrifice born in a manger, but rather as King and Lord. And I'm looking forward to seeing him coming back. Amen. At the end of Revelation, the word says, even so the spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus. And so we long for his return. And so as we celebrate this Christmas season, I want to encourage you that as Jesus came the first time, he will come a second time. And if we get to see it, how blessed and awesome that will be. Hallelujah. Let's pray this morning before we get into the word. Lord, we thank you so much for the word of God. Lord, it is the final authority in our life. We humble ourselves before it. And God, we don't want to live in a way that tries to manipulate the word out of its context, out of its uh, setting, Father, out of its authority in our lives, that we don't want to just use portions of it that make us uh, feel better about ourselves, Lord. But Lord, we humble ourselves to the complete authority of it. For we know that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it comes to do surgery on our hearts, to make us and sanctify us into the very image of the Lord our God, that it comes to empower and to edify and to exhort and to build and to tear down at times. But also, Father, we just submit ourselves to it. And we ask that the Holy Spirit would come and operate on our hearts this morning. We are hungry to hear from you. Lord, may our eyes be open to see and our ears be open to hear that, Father, that we can uh, understand clearly through the Spirit of God the word that you have given us that will edify us and exhort us today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So in Matthew chapter 24, we read some of this chapter last week, and I want to pick up in verse 44. And we read some of what he was talking about, the coming of the Son of Man, uh, no one knows the day and the hour when he will return. Not even the son knows the day or the hour, just uh, the father alone. And it says that in those days 
that it will be like the days of Noah where people were eating and drinking and marrying. How many of you know that nobody believed that the rains were coming when Noah said the rains were coming until the ark, the door of the ark was shut and the floods began to descend? That there was a callousness of heart, a refusal to hear. And we live now in those same days where there is a refusal to hear about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. About the salvation that is offered through the, the Son. Amen. That there is a callousness of heart, a coldness of heart that has taken place over mankind that doesn't want to hear the truth of God. And Jesus says that before my return, you will see these things taking place. It will be as in the days of Noah. Let's pick up in verse 44. He says, therefore you also must be ready. Say ready. ready. Say it again. Say ready. ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a sobering thing to read. I don't want to come in here and try to instill fear in you because the return of our Lord and Savior is a joyous thing. But it is also a very sobering thing that we should within our hearts feel a little bit of reverence and fear before the Lord that we make sure that we are ready when, and when he returns to gather his bride. Jesus himself says, you must be ready. You must be about the things that I've asked you to do for my kingdom. You must be diligent in what I have given you to do. For when I come back and I find you doing so, then I will reward you according to what you have done. But for those servants who have said, I forget it, and their fervency for the Lord has waned, it says that they'll be placed where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a sobering thought. As we go on, we see that he begins to lay out a parable here about the ten virgins. And it says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, everyone say ready. Those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour of the return of the Son of Man. Flip me with me, if you would, real quickly. Keep your finger right there and go with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. And this is going to give us a little more insight into this parable here. Jesus says, says this, Stay dressed for action. I love that. And keep your lamps burning. What did we just read about? Lamps burning, torches burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service, and, he will, and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready. There's that word again. You must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect, at an hour you do not know. I love that stay, dre stay dressed for action because you can actually take that translation and take it all the way back to Exodus where they were preparing 
for the, fi- the, uh, the Passover lamb, the, the dinner of the Passover lamb. And if you go and you look and you research that scripture right there, it says that they must eat the, the dinner of the Passover lamb dressed and ready. It says that they must have their belt on, their sandals on. Why would, must they be dressed and ready while they are eating that final supper? Because the next thing to happen was their exodus would take place that they would leave the slavery of Egypt and be brought out into the wilderness. Those two things Jesus was correlating when he said, stay dressed, stay dressed for action. So in other words, as we are living in this place, we must live in a way that is ready for his return. We must be clothed and ready. We must be vigilant in our walks with him so that when he returns, that we are able to take part in our exodus. Let's flip back over into Matthew chapter 25, and let's break down this parable just a little bit about the ten virgins. The first thing that I want you to notice is that they were all virgins. Okay, what does that mean? That means that they were all, quote, unquote, believers. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Jesus is talking about believers and unbelievers here. Again, this is very sobering stuff. What's he saying? He's saying that there will be people in the church. Some will go and some will not. That there will be those who confess upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but because of their lack of fervency in their heart, because of their uh, hypocritical ways, because they have allowed sin to overtake their lives, because they are not ready for his return, they will not partake in the rapture. Again, very sobering things. We have to remember to stay ready, to stay vigilant. We can't be lulled to sleep. There is something I continuously pray in my prayer times as I'm praying for the church in general, and that is that the church would wake up. Because as a pastor, when you come in and you see people week after week, sometimes you can just tell that they are spiritually asleep, that the devil has lulled them into a place of complacency and indifference, and they're becoming like some of these people who say, oh, well, the master is a long time coming. That I can go ahead and live any way I want to live. I can go ahead and do whatever I want to do. I don't have to be separate from the world. I don't have to take care of these issues in my life. I don't have to crucify my flesh on a continual basis. No, I can just be. And the devil begins to lull these people to sleep to where you see no fruit in their lives. You see no diligency and no fervency of spirit. You see no change within them. And Jesus is warning us, saying, don't fall asleep. That's why he says, stay awake and be ready. He continues to say these things because the enemy has a plan to put the church to sleep. To make us think that the way that we live, the things that we do here and now don't matter, that nobody is seeing them. That's not the truth. If you go into Revelation, you look about the banquet that we will be attending that I just talked about. It says that we will attend that banquet dressed in our righteous acts. What does that mean? That means the things that you have done right here on this earth, that is the garments that you will be wearing when you pull a chair up to that table. And I made a joke about this last week, but I'm serious. I don't want to show up scantily clothed. I don't want to have just one righteous act that I'm like trying to string from top to bottom. I mean, I'm being a little funny here, but it's the truth. No, I want to be clothed in the righteousness of our God. I want to be clothed in acts and deeds that made a difference for his kingdom while I was here on this earth. Because I can tell you what, 80, 85 years if the Lord tarries is nothing compared to an eternity spending with him. For all will be revealed and everything that is done in secret will be brought to light. See, Christmas just isn't about getting gifts. It is a sobering reality of the fact that he came once, fulfilled his promise, and he will come again for his church, and he will capture those who have lived according to his word and have crucified the ways of the flesh that took him up on the offer when he said, come and follow me. What else do we notice? We notice that five of the virgins were foolish and five were wise. Over and over again in the word, sin is called folly or foolishness. So that we can surmise that Jesus was saying the foolish ones were the ones that got wrapped up into the ways of sin, the ways of the flesh, the desires of this world, and that's what began to drain the oil out of their lamps. 
They weren't prepared. They weren't ready. They didn't go the distance, if you would. Paul says those who endure to the end will be saved. It's easy to start something. It's a completely, totally different thing to finish something. I've told you this before, church, and I'll say it again. It should encourage you. I don't want to just fall over the finish line. When my time is done, I don't want to come stumbling in, just torn to pieces and tattered and barely making it by the skin of my teeth. No, I want to come bursting through the finish line. That I want to come running into the arms of my Savior and hear him say over me, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest and receive the reward that I have prepared for you. That I've taken notice of your life. Amen. Church, we live for another We notice also that wisdom in the word is compared time and time again to walking in the ways of the Lord. Walking in the ways of the Spirit. It says in Corinthians that the Spirit of God gives to us wisdom that comes straight from the throne room of God. As we walk according to the ways of the Spirit, we are beneficiaries of that wisdom, and we become as the wise virgins. We supply ourselves with plenty of oil and anointing so that when Jesus returns, we have enough for our lamps to be burning. That we live with a fervency of spirit in our relationship with God. That we are able to finish that which we have started. Jesus himself said a foolish builder doesn't count the cost of what he is about to build before he begins building. That we have to realize as we say that we are believers. Hmm. There's a lot of people that confess Christ as Lord. But the number dwindles for those who believe that Jesus is Lord. What do you mean by that, Pastor Aaron? I've sat in church for many, many years, and they've told me at the end of every service, if I just come up and pray this prayer and confess that Jesus is Lord, I'll be saved. No, the word actually says that if you believe in your heart, (laughs) it's not just about empty words. It's about a change of heart from the inside out. Let me just put it in a very practical way. As fun as it would be, because I'm kind of a thrill seeker guy, when I go skiing, I like to launch myself off of things that make me fly like 15 feet through the air. I like to go as fast as humanly possible. The guys that stand in the way telling everybody to slow down, I just want to run over those guys because they're just in my way. All right, I like to go fast. I like to do things on the edge. I I get a kid. I know my wife's like, don't tell me that. She never wants to hear that when I come home. So as fun as it would be for me to go up to like the highest cliff and take a good running leap because of what it would feel like to like jump off of that thing and to fly for a few moments, I mean, as great as that would be, I know and believe that gravity will end me. So that keeps me from jumping off of that cliff. Let's make the comparison to if we actually believe that Jesus is Lord, it should make a difference and a change in the way that we behave and the way that we act. It's easy to confess Jesus is Lord. It's a totally different thing to believe that Jesus is Lord. And when we do, we don't go running off cliffs, church. We don't let the foolishness of this world invade our hearts and our lives. No, we stay ready. We stay vigilant. We stay tuned in to our creator. Amen. The last thing is that five were prepared and ready and five were not. We have read so many scriptures today that talk to us about the returning of the Lord saying, be ready, be prepared, that we must always be living with one eye to the sky, remembering that he will come for us again. Amen. Keep your light burning through the oil of the Holy Spirit. Keep your light, your lamp burning through the oil of the of the Holy Spirit. Flip with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. We just got done doing a a, uh, series on Philippians, and so many of you will remember this scripture. Helps us understand a little bit more about what am I saying. Keep your light burning through the oil of the Spirit. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul says this to us. He says, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my present, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent, 
children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, gosh, do we see the correlation here? So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am being to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. What's Paul saying here? He's saying, be vigilant about your life. Walk, walk without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. Present yourself unto him righteous and holy. Keep your light shining before men. That when Jesus returns to collect us, he doesn't have to sift through the darkness. No, he just finds the lights and pulls those out of the darkness. Let your light so shine before men, Jesus told us and encouraged us. Let's turn over, just to bring this a little bit more home, to John chapter 1. Are you getting something this morning? John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Listen, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all may believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. So what is the light? It's the life, the agape, zoe life of Christ that has been planted into our hearts. And each and every day, you get up and make a decision if you're going to live according to that life or you're going to live according to the old life. That every minute of every day, you have a decision to make, and it requires discipline and crucifixion of the flesh and saying no to the desires and the ways of this world in order to possess and to hold on to the life of Christ that is the light of all men. So if you want to keep your light burning, you have to keep following the life of Christ. Oh, it's good teaching. So that when we look at how Jesus lived as our example, we align ourselves with that life. The Spirit comes to give us life and life more abundantly. So as the Spirit leads us in our walk with Christ, as we align ourselves with the life that comes through the Spirit and the obedience to the Holy Spirit and His leading in your life, then your light begins to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. As you fuel yourselves in time of prayer, in times of study of the word, in times of fellowship at church, hallelujah, as you walk in the ways of the spirit instead of the ways of the flesh, what are you doing? You are pouring oil into your flask. You are regenerating, hallelujah, the oil for the lamp so that when that lamp begins to burn and dim down a little bit, you can dip that lamp quickly into the oil and the light will shine brightly again. So many Christians live on the defensive. They don't hit their knees until trials come. They don't seek out the Father until it's difficulty time, until the stress of life begins to happen. No, as a believer in the life of Christ, we should continuously be seeking His Spirit, continuously being in a place of prayer and worship and fellowship with Him so that we can be on the offensive when the trials come, when the tribulations come, when the difficulties come. And then that light of Christ will overcome the darkness like we just read. Come on now. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not, will not, and cannot overcome it. See, so many of you are getting into the darkness, and then you're trying to pump the oil into your flask so you can get the lamp burning. Continue to have your lamp burning, your flask full, so that when the darkness comes and envelops around you, that light stands burning and strong, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Hallelujah. 
Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. I believe that this scripture right here is the calling of every believer. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Oh, the world is so hungry to see the light of Jesus. Jesus never had a problem getting a crowd. He didn't have to send out mailers. Right? He didn't have to have all the smoke and the lights and the coolest sanctuary and all that type of stuff. Man, he would just walk in the light of Christ that came out of him, would draw men unto him wherever he would go. We have to get over this fable of thinking that people don't want to hear or see the light of Jesus. They are desperate for it. problem is, is that we don't have enough believers actually living in the light of Christ. And so those people who say they're believers, the world sees no light. And they begin to wonder, why? What's the difference between you and I? I don't see any light in you. You're just as overcome by darkness as I am. Why would I want what you got? No, but I believe that as the Holy Spirit begins to rise up in us, as we begin to live righteously, as we begin to make ourselves holy according to the leading of the Spirit of God, as he builds us up and edifies us right, and that light is shining before men, we won't be able to keep the people out of church. Trust me, if God is showing up and the light of Jesus is there, people are drawn to it like moth to a flame, baby, like moth to a flame. 